of time just there. We'll just turn that on and then that. And then as we go to the meeting, like. Do you remember you have to do a roll call? That's right, everything's a roll call. Linda, you can hear I don't us? think there's any votes today, though. Hi. Okay. I can hear you. Already on. That's good. I am alone. Okay. <laughs> so we're just getting started. I'm going to call the order and then these. Okay. Good evening, everybody. We're going to call the meeting of the Substandard Living Conditions Committee uh, to order um, at 7.03, December 12, 2019. Um, clerk, if you want to call the roll. Uh, Chairman Alderman Tom Lopez. Here. Uh, Vice Chair Alderman Ernest Jetty is here. Alderman Jan Schmidt. I am here. Alderman Linda Harriet Gathright. Present. Um, and Alderwoman Gathright, um, we have to ask, uh, are you alone and what's the reason you're not here? I'm alone and I thought this meeting was canceled. Okay. So a little miscommunication happens all the time. Um, also is um, Alderman at large, Brandon Michael Laws, is not here. Yep. And, and also in attendance is Alderman Patricia Clee. Okay, very good. Um, I don't see anybody here for public comment unless uh, Mr. Mack, you would like to make public comment? Pass? Okay. Um, we did not schedule a presentation. The only two agenda items that we have are uh, two items for discussion. The first item is cold weather evictions, resources, and procedures. I think that's what you're, you're here for. Uh, Director Mack, if you'd like to come up, City Welfare Officer. I'm not sure what your title is, actually, or how to address you. Thank you. Do you prefer Mr. You, Mack? I, Bob is fine. General uh, Mack? Okay. Bob Mack, I'm the Welfare Officer for okay. the City of Nashua, part of the Division of Public Health and Community Services. <laughs> um, okay. So the purpose of this committee has been to look the, the formation of this committee was originally due to public uh, attention to issues um, in areas of high density but low uh, income housing. There was um, newspaper articles and coverage of bed bug situation that was happening in the country barn. Um, once that was investigated, uh, additional concerns began to be raised about some other properties that were there. And so the intent was to um, evaluate at the time exactly what substandard living condition complaints there were in the city, um, what the nature of those complaints were, and what their impact was on uh, the perp uh, on individuals that were in those um, housing situations. So the first two years uh, was primarily focused um, on a small number of um, housing, pro housing providers that had a much higher impact on the community than average. They had a much higher amount of inspections that were being done, that had a much higher uh, number of complaints, uh, a larger number of fire and police interaction, um, and things of that nature. So at the end of, the, of each year, they were analyzing data and assessing those numbers and those reports in order to come up with action. And they basically uh, generated legislation to um, create administ or support administrative uh, enforcement of um, inspection issues. Um, so the end result was that the uh, fire department, the health department, and building department, when repeat offenders were not acting to um, make improvements based on the concerns that were raised, then they would have an administrative fine by the city before going to um, court. And this was to prevent landlords from potentially ignoring needs for repairs repeatedly until just before a court date and then ultimately fixing it. So it made it so that the city has the ability to respond a little bit more rapidly um, and in a, a scaled way rather than just waiting until we had to take them to court and then addressing it, including all of the expenses that that entailed. In this legislative term, we continued the committee um, 
I had conversations with uh, Alderman at large, uh, Brian McCarthy, to that effect prior to the start of the year, that there were still complaints and concerns about substandard living conditions in the, com in the city. It was still known that there were multiple um, landlords that had difficulty maintaining properties that were meeting the expectations, the general expectations of the city. Um, and so we decided to focus on uh, this legislative term, how to educate both landlords and tenants as to the resources and the challenges that were being involved. And we were meeting to create um, meetings and recorded uh, discussions and presentations that could be pointed to as a resource. So all of that's just history. The discussion before us uh, of eviction procedures and that type of thing is relevant because it's the winter now, so evictions have a disproportionate impact. If you're being evicted, you know, it could be into cold weather. So we wanted to talk, um, and we invited um, uh, Director Mack and m other city departments in to discuss those resources to that effect. The second um, discussion item um, has to do with uh, inspections and sorry, uh, the expectations of landlords to maintain occupancy. So what does the city do in order to make sure that a occupancy or a dwelling unit meets the minimum standards of occupancy, especially in the winter? The reason that we are, that I, I put both of those things on the agenda is because I think we have to have an ultimate discussion on the committee as to recommendations for its continued activity. There hasn't been any legislative um, pieces of legislation put to the Board of Aldermen that have been referred to this committee over the past two years. And that's not intentional, it's not an intentional slight or anything, it's just the, the issues that we've come up to have been largely regional in nature. And so without specific courses of action for this committee, it's facing another two years of meeting without any actual business before it. So we should have that discussion as to whether the current role of the committee is is meeting its original intent, whether that role needs to be expanded or modified, or whether there is a role. Um, so that's just uh, framing the context of all the discussions. I wanted to get that explanation out um, before we started having a conversation. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything I just said? Uh, Alderman Klee, were you just waving? or? <clears throat> <clears throat> no, it, it's not so much that I have. I have a question um, for about what your your discussion is. Um, I'm just very interested in finding out what we we do with um, people that are possibly evicted during this cold weather or anything like that. So I I really'd like to hear what that discussion is. So thank you okay. for yep. bringing that to the uh, the forefront. All right, then if there's no other questions, then let's get to what people should do about evictions. Um, Bob, if you'd like to give us a quick overview of what city re city welfare's experience with this is. Absolutely. Again, I'm Bob Mack, the welfare officer for the city of Nashua. Um, I am not an attorney, so I can't speak to some of the legal aspects of eviction, but I can speak from my experience as being the welfare officer for the last uh, nearly 18 years with the city. Um, basically, evictions during the winter are not really any different than any other time of year. Um, there are a variety of reasons that tenants can be evicted um, from their, their rental unit, breaking uh, rules in the lease, non-payment of rent, that sort of thing. Um, some of the reasons for eviction are uh, we can address through the welfare department. Basically, if it's a <coughs> non-payment of rent issue, um, a tenant can come in and apply for assistance. We go through our eligibility process. Um, we determine if they qualify for assistance with uh, rental payment. Um, oftentimes, if it's, if it's something that they owe more than one month of rent, we might be able to assist with one month and connect them to a community resource that can supplement that and, and pay that so that they can remain in the unit. Um, if they have more than three evictions in a 12-month period, they may be able to uh, be evicted regardless of any payment of rent. So there are some, some limitations there, but we do our best to work with landlords and, and advocate for clients and tenants. Um, but again, the eviction process during the winter is not really any different than any other time of year. Um, if there are issues with the apartment, um, and this may go to the, the 
latter portion of your, your meeting this evening. Um, if there are uh, heat issues or, or issues of uh, not uh, taking care of the apartment, upkeep of the apartment on behalf of the landlord, there are uh, legal reasons and ways for tenants to withhold rent, which doesn't mean they don't pay their rent. It just means they hold on to the rent until such time as the landlord takes the appropriate action. Those types of situations, if they come to the Welfare Department, are referred to the Code Enforcement Office, um, and they uh, usually give some guidance to the tenants as to how to proceed accordingly. Uh, we also do refer a number of tenants to contact New Hampshire Legal Assistance if they need some legal advice as to how to deal with uh, their eviction situation. Uh, so kind of circling back around to the rental situation, um, as I mentioned, we have an application process. Uh, a resident of Nashua can come in with their lease, ID, social security card, and present to the welfare department, fill out an application, and require documentation. <laughs> we'll assess that, that situation, go through a budget, and oftentimes we can assist by paying up to one month's rent. And then when the, uh, the landlord agrees and they receive that, that voucher for payment, that tenant can remain in the apartment they then have to continue to pay their rent moving forward to avoid any further eviction action. So um, in the cases where we cannot salvage an apartment and they do get locked out, we do sometimes have people that just show up in our office that have already been locked out. They didn't come to see us before it got to that point, so there wasn't any opportunity to pay that rent. We will look to connect them to some alternative shelter resource, either um, through one of our local shelter programs like the Nashua Soup Kitchen and Shelter or the Southern New Hampshire Rescue Mission, uh, or we may put them up temporarily in some sort of um, temporary motel placement or even a temporary rooming house kind of situation. Those are some of the places that are more readily available. Uh, unfortunately, during this time of year, they're less readily available because more people are coming in out of the cold and, and renting up those units um, because of the weather. So it can sometimes become challenging where to refer people to to get some alternative shelter, but um, we've, we've had a good amount of success over, over our history in being able to, to get somebody placed somewhere at least temporarily until some longer term shelter becomes available or they find more permanent housing, or in some instances they're able to get back in, in their rental unit. We have a case, uh, for example, a recent case who came in to the office yesterday had been locked out of her apartment with her children. Um, we were able to get her set up temporarily in a motel, and through the course of, of the last 24 hours, she's been working some sort of arrangement to pay some of the back rent to be able to actually move back into the apartment and into the unit. <laughs> so in a case like that, we want to be very careful and cautious and make sure that we have the appropriate documentation that if the payment is, is made on behalf of the tenant, that they will actually be allowed to move back in the apartment because we don't want someone, once someone is locked out of an apartment, um, it, it's harder to get back in and it's really at the discretion of the landlord at that point. So we want to make sure we have that, that in writing and some documentation so that we can assist to help her get back into that unit and so we're working on that. But in the meantime, we have her placed in a a temporary motel setting. So that's kind of how we operate. It's, it's not a lot different than how we operate during the rest of the year, honestly, but um, it is, as Alderman Lopez said, it's, it's more concerning during this time of year when the weather is like it is. So for context, every person that you place in, that you help with an eviction or that you are able to place in the shelter is a relative success it moves, they move forward, they connect, they have the resources and the opportunity to connect with case managers uh, and that type of thing. And, you know, they're able to continue, not easily, but they're able to continue living in a housed, uh, independent uh, lifestyle. Uh, the people who are not able to have a disproportionate presentation in your statistics because you will continue to hear from them when there's no shelter available and there's no space available, it's it becomes an alert for the community that this is a shell this is a group that is not able to find shelter. This is somebody who's out in the the cold. That takes on a disproportionate role to the people that you're successful with because yeah. when those people are out, 
they're continuing to need services, they're continuing to impact city systems, yeah. they don't have a base of operations to operate from, so they need more help. Correct. And, and during the course of our eligibility interviews, where uh, <coughs> staff and, and myself were often assessing their other needs, mm -hmm. some of the, the um, issues that may have created their, their situation for being evicted, if there are either substance use issues identified or mental health issues that may be identified or even just some temporary crisis situation, we try to refer them to our, some of our community partners, mental health providers, uh, mobile crisis response, uh, the Hearts Peer Support Program. And some of those programs also have temporary respite stays where people can stay for one to seven days until they get stabilized. Assuming and they have a qualifying uh, mental health condition. That's yes, they have to have a qualifying in crisis. Yes, so they have to be. I don't know anybody to think that's a spa or anything. <laughs> no, no, and it's it's not a shelter program. It is a a temporary respite situation for stabilization, um, and it's during that time where they're in that program that we would continue to to try to engage with the the client as well as their their provider, uh, their supports, their case management supports, to see what's next so that when they are ready to be discharged from that program, they have a place to go. The school of thought typically is the best way to prevent homelessness is to prevent it <coughs> and not address it after somebody has become homeless. Yes. Um, and then the, the current uh, policies, at least from the federal level down, are the best way to address homelessness is to immediately house somebody and then from that base give them resources and opportunities. The shelters are designed to be addressing the people who, who fall in between that gap that cannot be rapidly rehoused. Uh, there wasn't, for whatever reason or another, there was not the ability to prevent an eviction or the removal of their access to housing. So then they are in the emergency shelter until they can fit into the pool of people who are either rehoused or you know, prevented from being uh, homeless. Our shelter capacity, this is sort of a well-worn shoe for me. Um, is in my opinion not adequate and we have made do with a whole patchwork of programs that are not entirely shelters. They provide shelter, they're sheltering, but they may not provide regular case management or you know, help with uh, providing benefits that might let someone get back on their feet like food stamps or uh, applying for public housing, uh, that kind of thing. So that's what I meant when I said there's a disproportionate representation as every family that isn't sheltered takes on the importance of like 20 families that are because you could have 20 families come in and as long as at the end of the day everybody has a place to go, you're fine. But the one family that doesn't, that's a, that's a problem. Is that fair? Yes, that's fair. Okay. Um, and the city welfare isn't the only part of uh, forestalling an eviction. Um, you had mentioned that there's a point of diminishing returns. Uh, for example, you could give somebody money, you could give a landlord for back rent, but then they're not legally obligated to let the person back in the apartment. So you need to make sure that your resources are being effectively spent. Um, and eviction isn't just like, you're evicted, get out. Like there's a whole process. Can you go over that step by the, the obvious steps to that and when the best time to start reaching out to city welfare is? Sure. Well, again, I'm not an attorney, but I can kind of speak to the experience uh, that I've had over my time as the welfare officer. Uh, generally, there is um, a, a demand for rent or notice to quit that is given to a tenant if the eviction is for non-payment of rent. Um, that should indicate an amount that they need to pay during a certain period of time. It's usually a seven-day window where they need to make that payment. If they do not make that payment, they are expected to vacate the unit. Um, and at that time, if, if that seven days has passed and they haven't made that payment, the landlord can then take that to court and proceed to obtain a writ of possession, which means that they can actually uh, take possession of that rental unit back from, from the tenant. So um, there is an appeal process that goes along with that as well. So generally, as soon as we, we would say as soon as someone gets one of those demands for rent or a notice to quit, they should contact their municipal welfare office. If they're here in Nashville, they should be contacting us so we can talk with them about an eligibility appointment and if we need to try to connect them to some other resources as well that could, could support their situation. Those, again, are situations where the eviction is for a non-payment of rent. If there are other reasons 
either having uh, unauthorized guests or breaking other aspects of the lease. Those are things that are kind of out of our purview that we can't, uh, we may not be able to rectify. Keeping in mind that when you're renting a property, the majority of Nashvans are renting it from a private citizen who owns that. So Nashua City Welfare can't exactly tell a landlord, hey, you got to keep this guy. Sorry, he broke your window and everything, but you know, it is what it is. Like, you can focus on financial support, but you can't necessarily force a landlord to keep a tenant if the tenant is breaking the conditions of the lease. Yes. Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. could I ask a question? Of course, yeah. Uh, of uh, Mr. Mack. So the, uh, you know, when the tenant gets a, a demand from a landlord, the, you know, the tenant would know before that point, point in time that they're, that they're not making their, their rental payment. Wouldn't that be a better time to contact you for assistance or before the, the, the legal procedure starts? That's a very good point, yes. That would be, uh, it, it would be best to reach out to us before it gets to that point. Um, they can come in, we can evaluate that situation and maybe avoid that process altogether. So just to clarify, we're not saying like plan to go to city welfare. They're like, uh, the Christmas season's coming up. I don't know if I can swing all this. I'm going to, I'm going to go to city welfare and let them know I'm not going to make my rent. We're talking about, um, if somebody knows they can't because they were laid off or there's like a reason they don't have additional funds, like there's means testing with city welfare. So, um, yes. Yes. just wanted to point that out that like, it's not an intentional act to go to city welfare. It's a last act. Um, after you've you something has happened that's impaired your ability to continue paying. Correct. As an alternative, though, there are a lot of programs you can work with that support you. So if you have, you know, impulsivity or you know, issues with keeping track of your spending that are maybe behavioral in nature, if you have like, um, if you grew up experiencing delayed milestones, like you weren't able to, you know, go through school unassisted, there's programs like Gateways and Plus Company that you can connect with. If they're if you're having you know mental health issues, mood disorders, behavioral things, you can work with community council or Greater National Mental Health, and a lot of those programs also have resources for budgeting, money management, for making sure that you don't fall through the cracks, or that if you have to start making decisions about how to prioritize bills, maybe they can help you with that too. But the idea is, if you start to get in over your head you want to be calling for the lifeguard well before you're already underwater. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. if I may. Um, if someone ha suits any of the uh, lists that Alderman just mentioned, the best person to come to is you. All of these issues that, that he mentioned? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, a number of these folks may already be connected to some of these resources. If... Uh, if people have questions about different resources in the community that they may want to access, they could contact 211, which is an information and referral line. So you literally that, dial 211. You literally dial 211 in the state of New Hampshire, and it should connect you to this information and referral line. And if you have specific issues, as uh, Alderman Lopez mentioned, um, if you are experiencing some mental health crisis, they can point you in that direction. Um, Follow up? Mm -hmm. So someone calls 211 and they say, I'm two months behind and um, I've lost my job. I don't have an eviction notice yet. What will they say? Will they say come to you at that point? They would most likely direct them to their municipal welfare office, which in, in our case would be the City of Nashville Welfare Department. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair? I, sure. I just want to add to that, that exchange, though, that if you identify that you've lost your job, 2 and one will probably also find an employment supportive agency, so such as the soup kitchen, or they might ask if you're working with Greater Nashua and see if you, they can send you towards them. So if, if those situations are happening, there are support services for many, many situations. So if you lose your job, that's actually a very good time to talk to the unemployment office and then start connecting with supportive agencies. Um, Alderman Clee. Thank you. Um, before I say what I was going to say, um, the one thing about them getting through to um, employment agency, the unemployment agency, most of them probably would not qualify if they've lost their job because they've been fired or 
for other reasons, but an employment agency that can help them try to connect would be a, a great thing. Um, the, the comment that I want to make is something I've been belaboring forever. <clears throat> I'd really like us to get, we, we've been hearing this a lot, but I still don't see a plan to get this information out to the public um, in a PSA form of, of some sort. We really need, I know you have the little pamphlets and we have 211 and everybody knows about 211, but I'm not sure that everybody knows call 211 if you have a rental crisis, you know, a rent crisis. They think of it if I have a um, addiction crisis or if I have a mental health crisis. I think they, they may think of 211, but they're not going to think if they have an employment crisis or if they're going to have that. And I'd really like to see something that the city of Nashville kind of gets out. And, and I've talked to you before. I know we have so many people that um, step up to the plate, and I, and I often refer to the front door agency. But the example that I've given to you before, ad nauseum, of the, of the people that were three months behind, mm -hmm. and they knew that they were going to have that seven days, it, it was okay if they contacted you, but then they had to go through a process of perhaps they're going to be turned down by you, and then they can hit some of the other agencies. Or, and, and the reason why they may be turned down is because they don't have a way, a mechanism of being able to pay the next month's rent. And, and those are kind of qualifications. So I really would like to see us get something out so this there's not people that are waiting two months or three months. Or, but like what um, Alderman Jetty had mentioned, I'm a month behind. I've lost my job. I know if I hit three months, he, they're going to Superior Court and I'm going to be thrown out on the street or locked out or something. So I'd really like to see us really get something out there to help these people. And uh, I, I don't know what the plan for that is. Do we have anything in the works? or? I mean, I thought even something is, you know, holding community events and saying, you know, are you having problem with your rent? Are you having problems with this? Just giving them an education thing, giving them 211, giving them these are some of the resources that you can get to. I, you know, I don't want them using this as a way of being able to buy Christmas presents, even though it would be nice sometimes. But it's a struggle for some people, though. Like, I know. they're okay taking a little bit of a hit on their rent, even though they know they shouldn't be. Right. Because you're looking at kids and saying, like, well, I can't get them nothing. Right. But, you know, <laughs> the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You just one step after another. Exactly. You can end up in pretty deep red. Yeah. Hi, can I just speak to something? Did you yep, uh, Alderman Gathred, if you're, if you're feeling like you're not being heard, then feel free to hit a button so we know you're raising your hand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So, you know, as you spoke to um, people, you know, this particularly this time of year, the, the New Year, the Christmas, the Thanksgiving, all those times when people are trying to make families happy and together. They really are. And sometimes people don't make the right decisions how to make that happen. But we have, like, the Salvation Army. I know that there are so many um, nonprofit organizations in Nashua. I'm just throwing um, Salvation Army out because I remember a year of one of my children's family and how they got their Christmas gift was through the Salvation Army. And then I remember another situation where... Um, Things came through United Way. We have so many organizations in Nashua today. I can think back to maybe about 20 years ago when I hit a difficult time, and I don't remember the name of the organization, but I think it was a city <laughs> organization, but it was I think it was my electric bill or something, but I had just got finished getting two cars repaired and didn't have money to pay that election. It was the winter time. And someone suggested to me, go down to this place that was down by and back of Wendy's at the time. I don't remember what it was, but somebody else might know. And they helped me to pay that bill for that one month. So I do know that Nashville has so many resources that I think it's hard for just one organization or even for the health department to actually know what all those organizations are. But that's the purpose of that 211 number. That is the purpose because whatever the issue is, 211 should be able to direct that person in the correct location to get the assistance that they need. So I, I hear what you're saying as far as what the health department should do. And when I speak of the health department, I'm talking about um, city welfare should do. I, I really believe that all these different scenarios 
should come through 211. That one number that we can put across the city and say, this is the number to call whatever the situation, and this is, they're going to give you the direction you need to go. And that's the purpose of 211. So I know you guys are talking about some other stuff, but I'm telling you, a one number is the best thing for anybody in this city to call. Okay. And that one number, so does that mean that we it needs to be more training in the 211? I don't know. I don't know what the, the answer is there. But I'm just saying to, to throw that at, at welfare and say, you need to do this, I personally have a problem with it. Because anybody that really needs help in this city, and I don't know how, whether any of you ever needed help, okay, 211 I thought was the best thing that Nashua ever came up with. Because it puts the person into where they need to go to get the assistance, whether it's city welfare, whether it's one of all the, what, 30-something nonprofits we have in Nashua, whatever it might be, or the churches. Because we have, Nashua have more people helping people than any other city that I know in the state of New Hampshire. Literally. Literally. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so proud to be here and to serve in the city, because I know that there's that help for every situation. And even to the, remember, even to the point that you need um, a lawyer's advice, that's here. Two-on-one would direct the person to that as well, particularly if they can't pay for a lawyer. So I'm, I'm not saying, I'm, what I'm saying is that I think, what we're doing and what we're trying to do is really great, but I think we need to truly look at where we need to really focus on making sure the right information is there. Because Bob is just one group. I'm sorry, Bob. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's just one part of this huge puzzle of people needing assistance in Nashua. I think I said my little bit. <laughs> That's fine. It's a little bit difficult over the phone to know when you're not, when you're done and when you're not. So it's, it's, um, I know. thanks That's for concluding. I'm, I'm, yeah. Um, so I agree that two on one is a very valuable resource. It's also something of a, um, brief dive. It's not a deeper dive. So there are definitely, uh, organizations in Nashua that, um, act as hubs. City welfare is a natural hub because people think of that in terms of city terms. Um, the soup kitchen may be another hub because when people are hungry, they'll go there and their staff is very well versed. Um, and then likewise, people may have resources that they're already connecting. They may go to Greater Nashville just because um, of personal behavioral issues, you know, difficulty with family or whatever. But a case manager mm -hmm. or a therapist can be very knowledgeable as well. But delivering the information in a way that a person uh, can understand that it's relevant to them is important as well. Um, and because there are so many programs in Nashua and there are so many changes to programs, 2 in one doesn't always get that, imp that information. So it is an ongoing effort in the Greater Nashua Continuum of Care to make sure that agencies, when they have a program change or they have um, you know, an update or a new contact person, that they tell 2 in one because 2 in one is, does have the role of being that initial hub. Um, we always run into programs that don't know about 2 in one because they're too new. Um, so it's not, there isn't just one way to, to approach a situation. 2 one is a very valuable tool, but some people may not have access to phones or that type of thing. So they may respond better to using resources at the library where there's an internet, or um, they may be, I need to talk to somebody in person, I don't feel comfortable talking about this over the phone. There's a lot of different ways to do similar things. Um, sure. Alderman Klee? <clears throat> I, I absolutely agree with um, both you. Um, Alderman Lopez, as well as um, Alderman, Alderwoman um, Gathright. We do have a continuum of care page where we list all of the those that can help with, with phone numbers and so on. I mean, and it's the National Soup Kitchen Keystone, uh, Bridges, the New Hampshire Legal Assistance, and so on. But again, it's you go to your page, and you can see that when you get down towards the bottom, continuum of care, it's still the idea that these people need to to, to get this information. And, and I believe that all of these places probably have little brochures that say, but there's still a step-by-step -step procedure. And oftentimes they have to start 
with welfare before things like the other agencies may or may not be able to help them. And sometimes it's a matter of you can do a little bit and then others can do a little bit more, or they perhaps get a denial from you and then the others can kind of kick in. So there is a procedural, and, and 211 may or may not know that. I think 211 is phenomenal, and actually that's even listed in the continuum of care as, as far as 211, but it's the, the education that I really want to get out there, and that's why I say about a PSA or, a, you know, if you have this problem, contact these people. You know, or if you have, if you don't know who to contact, call two one one. Again, that may be the right start, but to to have this brochure, or something that that tells people about all of these, all of these services and so on. And I agree with um, Older Woman Gathright. We have phenomenal services and the most caring people in Nashua. Uh, as I as I go around and I talk to different people, I'm, I'm blown away by all the services. And I also know that many of them are up to capacity that you know, we're, we're hitting those walls at certain times, and I'm sure this is the time of year that we hit it more. Um, but I also think that there are people out there who just don't know of these services. And uh, so that's why I keep harping on, on education. And, um, but I, if I can not change this up so much, but do we have any more or less um, evictions during the, the winter months? Do you find that during this time of year you have more people coming in with this type of a need? I, I wouldn't say there's there's more evictions okay. uh, or less evictions during or, this time of year. I think it's it's a fairly steady process. I think uh, some of the, the issues that were brought up earlier about people making decisions to spend money on different things mm -hmm. may be a little more common this time of year. And we also move into income tax season. So hopefully people are getting, if they're getting refunds, they're using that money wisely and, and they're making up any any gap and any back due rent that they may have when they get that that money. So those are things that, as we see people come into our office, we advise them to do and to plan accordingly moving forward. So, Well, thank you. There are additional barriers in the winter in terms of transportation and being able to like effectively move your belongings out or in or whatever. Um, so it, winter tends to be like a, a catch-22 where there's a lot of people who are aware that it's winter and so they're much more careful about spending and savings because they, nobody wants to be out in the middle of the, the snow. But there's also people who may, the expenses that are brought on by winter might have an additional impact. Um, I do think it's important to note that there is something of a myth that goes around where people say, oh, you can't evict me during the winter because it's the winter time. That is not true. No. Utilities can't be shut off that provide heat, but you can definitely true. still accrue a bill, and you those two things should not be confused. Um, Alderman Gathman, you have hit your button a couple times? <laughs> I know, yes. I, I, I just want to say that, you know, when when there was a point brought up that I was I thought was quite interesting because even for veterans, um, there are so many places, even the Veterans Administration during this time of year, I know they have an 800 number <clears throat> because I've sent people to, to the veterans to get gifts for their family. And, and, and I guess for me, the gifts are very nice. I mean, kids get bikes. They get, you know what I mean? They get computers. They get all sorts of things that typically even a working parent might not be able to afford, to be honest with you. So, you know, I mean, it's just so much out there right now. And, you know, help for people that are struggling this time of year for themselves and their children, for the fourth, for the family. And I just feel as though, I don't know. I hear you, Trish. Well, um, Clee represents uh, <laughs> Alderman Clee. I'll answer to I all hear of what them. you're saying. I know we have so many hats, but I hear what you're saying. And it's so much out there. I don't know if there's, in my opinion, that 211 is the, is the, where the updates need to go to get people in the right direction. I, I don't see the calls flooding city health department to get to that point. I really don't see that. Okay. That's why the 211 was put into place. So all I'm saying is that, you know, whether we have to do due diligence with the different um, community organizations that need to keep them updated, you know, you know what I mean? I think that the, the, 
it, the, the problem or the issue might be, as someone stated, 211 doesn't get updated. So that falls back on to all the organizations that are part of 211. If there were That's one, my oh, sorry, Alderman <laughs> Gathray, whenever you pause, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, I know. In my experience as a social worker, and Bob, I think you can probably agree with this, there's never one problem and there's never one solution to that problem. So 211 sure. absolutely has a role. And some people using 211 may just say, like, where can I get help with gifts or that type of thing? That's the kind of thinking we would promote where we say, like, ask for help before you already need it. It wasn't intended to say, like, if you're going to make a decision about Christmas, you know, uh, right. then then use city welfare to make up for it. That's where people start having to make a little bit of a deal with the devil because they don't have enough resources. If you know what all right. of your options are, you typically can make a more informed choice, and you don't get into that situation where you don't have any choices and you have to go for help. I also believe that Alderman Klee was talking specifically about rent assistance and programs and services that city welfare provides that is a challenge to present on. Um, the scope of services is pretty vast, so just explaining what it does uh, is a challenge for uh, Bob because I've watched him try to do this repeatedly and there's a different example every single time. <laughs> like, he uses examples of things that they have just done and, I mean, maybe there's a maybe there's a place on the website where you can put down, like, case studies or examples of people that you've, you've helped or, or that type of thing. Um, we have asked in the past as part of a different effort for uh, a public presentation on city welfare eligibility guidelines um, with the understanding that those are being reviewed and no one guideline or situation addresses all uh, all needs. Uh, Alderman Gathright? I agree with that. I do feel as though we should have something that says what our welfare department, um, I guess, is eligible to do for any citizen. And when he spoke to the part about um, using um, up to one month rent, I think that needs to be known so that people would really know that, you know, you can't come and expect to get two or three months. You know what I mean? So I think, I don't know, the, in short, some guideline. And maybe it's there, and I haven't been there. So, you know, Bob is there. It's something they didn't enlighten me. But I think there should be something or – is the guidelines – Well, why don't we let, Alder, why don't we let uh, Bob comment on that because he's got to be talking okay. a bit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if I may, there's, there's a lot to uh, kind of respond to here. But I think as, as far as the, the communication around what we, we can do with the welfare department, I do agree 2-1-1 is a tremendously valuable resource – for a variety of, of referrals to services. And there's also a need for us to get the word out as well. And I believe I had mentioned at a, at a previous meeting that our Division of Public Health and Community Services is going through a transformation process. And part of that is um, with our, our marketing and messaging and how we're getting that word out as, as chief uh, public health strategists, of which welfare is, is a part of public health. Um, we did recently do a presentation on municipal welfare in general, that process at our continuum of care meeting. So that information got out to, to some more agencies. Um, mm -hmm. And we do get a number of referrals actually directly from landlords who know of our program because they've had other tenants that have been in the same situation. And so they will directly refer their tenants to us before it gets to a point where it's out of hand. Now, not all landlords will do this, but a number of them will. Um, and, of course, some of those other agencies, as you mentioned, uh, Alderman Clee, the, the process that, that we have to follow, that they have to follow for, for applying and being determined to be eligible, if they go to that agency first, they will direct them to us and say, go to City Welfare, see what they can do, and then come back with their notice of decision, or, or we can consult in that way. Oftentimes, when people do come to our office directly, we assess the situation. If we understand we can't assist alone, we start that process and try to connect with those other local resources as well, or we refer the client to go to see them with this notice, and then we, we keep that process going. So we do work very well together as a system. Um, I appreciate the, the point that was brought up that it's 
the, the welfare department can't do it alone. The public health department can't do it alone. We have a lot of community partners that we work with. Um, and we do have a, a very cohesive group of agencies in the community that have been working together for quite some time. So, um, and I think I had another point, but I went off on that well, one. Well, I would I also add that the I welfare want. guidelines are literally online. Mm -hmm. They're just written yes. in legalese. Like, the problem is the average person has trouble absorbing the information. Uh, not all the Ringetti over here, but yeah. most of us would have trouble reading like a step-by-step -step process that is incredibly convoluted and defines terms yes. and all that. Um, and then the more distress you're in, the the smaller your window for being able to process that information. Correct. So the, the information is there as it's legally supposed to be. It's just in a difficult format. Um, City Welfare does uh, puts a lot of work into engaging in the community and creating relationships. Um, and that's been the strategy that we've we've very effectively used in terms of the continuum of care and that type of thing. Um, but there are also other stakeholders we may be able to do a better job of engaging. So I don't know. Um, uh, Alderman Gathery, before I address your question, I just want to ask a quick question of uh, uh, Bob here. Okay. Is there is there a do's and don'ts of landlords or resources that City Welfare provides that landlords can give to their tenants? Like, is there something for them to look at as a resource? Um, that that's a good question. I mean, we have our our resource toolkit that is online. It's on on the the Welfare Department site. It's on the Greater National Continuum of Care site. Um, that is something that landlords can give out if if they wish. Um, they can also, uh, you know, I go back to two one one because it's an easy thing to remember. If someone just dials two one one, they can get connected to uh, an invaluable amount of of resources. But um, there isn't like a how to be a landlord with a tenant who doesn't pay rent, uh, like for uh, sure. Not coming from the welfare department. Um, I don't know if some of the um i'm trying to think if like a neighbor works um does something like that if there's any sort of landlord uh, 101 training course that takes place maybe through new hampshire housing finance authority I, i'm just not aware of that but that's a good good question i believe there is i've heard of i've heard of that i don't know that neighbor works is the one that does it i think it might be um maybe the Community Asset Coalition, but either way, it's definitely something that we could look at, at trying to build more visibility. If we could get the Chamber of Commerce to partner or something, then that kind of goes with our committee's theme of not just addressing the tenants' needs, but also yes. making sure that landlords are right. supported in doing that. It's, it's definitely counterintuitive to have a landlord who is who has a tenant who's not paying and be okay with that. Yeah. That's what landlords think when they start taking on tenants. But then when they're actually faced with evicting a mother and her, her child or whatever, no, they're right in there half the time like, okay, how do I help with this? What resources? Because nobody really wants to be that bad guy. If, um, if I may. Oh, oh sorry. I'm sorry. Um, exactly to your point, uh, Alderman Lopez, is we, we are – more appreciative if a landlord sends somebody, as soon as they serve somebody, they go down to the welfare department to see if you can rectify this versus let it build up to two, three, four months. And then it's it's usually a situation that, that can't be resolved. So the landlords that do know the system, that know how we work, can refer people early on and maybe even before they serve that notice to quit, they say, why don't you go to city welfare and see if they can help you resolve this so we don't have to follow this path and we can just rectify the situation and move on from there. So, uh, Alderman Gathright, were we neglecting you there? Yes. Sorry. All right. So I'm going to go back to when there was a conversation about online and being uh, difficult to understand um, the city welfare unless you have a Ph.D. or you're a lawyer. I agree with you 100%. So what I'm saying, what I, for me, then why can't we come up with maybe 10 questions like... Um, Frequently what asked questions. Is, you know, yeah, frequently asked questions, something like that with maybe two sentences as an answer. You know what I mean? Something like that. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. It, it, it's been attempted, it's um, and it's, it's an ongoing process. The difficulty is the more you summarize, the more you leave out. So, like, as soon as you start oh. doing that, somebody points to that group of guidelines and then says, oh, but this one doesn't say. Um, one of the suggestions that we've been working on in the little mini-meeting we had was, uh, numbering them at least so that if a specific guideline was being referenced, you could at least be directed to that point. Um, but mm. it's that's definitely a, an evolving work in progress. That's a whole other committee, I think. 
Um, okay. Alderman, Alderman, please hand us up. Um, yeah, you, your frequently asked questions link is broken. Oh, <laughs> um, no. <yeah. laughs> but that's good just, to know. Just to let you know. Just to let you know. Okay. But on that same page, where where you have how does city welfare work, um, guidelines and standards, as you pointed out, that there as well as the um, the continuum of care um, toolkit. Toolkit is there, and as well as just the Greater National Continuum of Care webpage that says how can you get involved or how can you get help, and I and I love that's there. We also have the the small little paragraph about homelessness assistance. You give an eight hundred number and two one one. Again, great long term um, care. Talking about the TANF, the foster care, and all these all these types of things. And again, you reference New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. So. Um, to to um, Alderman Gathright, um, I think two and one is great. I think the majority of people, at least that I I find that need help, are going to be sent right to your doorstep. Um, so that's why, again, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. you know, I it, it sometimes it's frustrating, and I can tell you the gentleman that I dealt with, that that family that I dealt with, that was going to be out on the street, um, making all these phone calls, and and mm -hmm. not knowing where to go, and actually calling people in the wrong order was more frustrating and probably by the time he got to your doorstep, he was not a happy camper. And you probably had to deal with a very irate, frustrated person. Um, I'm not saying that he was or wasn't, but I'm just saying as I can, I can see myself yeah. doing that when I've been passed along from person to person. So while 211 is good, if you don't know where to go, educating people as to where to start, step one. You know, you yeah. seem to be the nexus and the entrance to many of the services you may not be the one to provide the service, but you're going to be the nexus to to help them um, either get turned down or whatever, and then go on to the next spot. So, two one one is great for a variety of things. If you just you're desperate, and you don't know where to go, but if we can educate people where to start, we're going to stop their frustration. I would also observe that as Alderman, we have very limited oversight of two one one because it's grant funded by the United Way. It's actually operated by EverSource, right, uh, Bob? It's, I well, believe they, they have. They assist two one one by providing uh, a place where they can house their phone banks and and such. So and it's funded by uh, these are partners that we don't have oversight of. So it's a little easier and to to look at city departments, um, not to single out city welfare explicitly. There are other roles that other departments have in these things too. The next topic probably includes them a lot more. Um, but then there's also like visibility things like if somebody's looking for city welfare on the website some people may find that a challenge because you can find everything about elections and uh voting and all that kind of stuff as as visual buttons but some people don't have the internet um Sorry. familiarity to hit the little hamburger thing up on the upper left and then go down to you know city services and, and work your way through that decision tree so it's it's difficult because there may be very valuable information that's just hard to find um alderman Gas rate, and then uh, I feel like I'm on Jeopardy here. I want a button <laughs> like all the gas right has. Yeah, yeah. So, just a reminder: being blind, you have to actually say, "Excuse me." No, I don't know. So, all the main gas right, and then Jetty. <laughs> okay. One. I, I don't know. I was just thinking about that since I mean, you have since it. we are the substandard <laughs> housing, but we seem to be reaching into a lot of stuff. Um, maybe. In our next meeting, we can have a couple of the nonprofits come in and talk about what they do in terms of helping people that uh, are less fortunate. You know what I mean? I agree, just, um, and that was why I wanted to have, have that conversation. That, I think the uh, role of the the role of the substandard living conditions committee was to address the endpoint of a problem, and basically, what we've been seeing for the past two years is that. We don't. We can't really address it at the end point fairly. That's where you know landlords right, have already having having difficulty, and where uh, tenants are already yeah. facing needs. So that was part of the further discussion I wanted to have. Okay, so I'll save that for later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alderman Jetty, thank you. I I have a a few questions. You you mentioned uh, you know, so in the situation where people uh, you, you know you can't resolve their their predicament uh, with fi with financial aid or providing a voucher, uh, and and they need shelter. You could you tell tell us? Uh, are you talking about uh, physical shelters like uh, Southern New Hampshire Rescue and those types of places, 
Or are you talking about motel rooms and hotel rooms? It, it may be either. It may be one prior to the other uh, becoming available. It may be, you know, um, oftentimes in the case of evictions, if, if it's determined that our assistance will not prevent the eviction, there's still some time that they have, and we'll try to direct them to housing, other housing resources, but there aren't a lot of um, housing navigator type resources in the community, if you will, unless you're, uh, you know, you're a, of a certain population that is eligible for certain case management type resources. So um, we have, as a continuum of care, applied for funding, grant funding, to get a, a um, coordinated entry worker, housing navigator in our community to work within our system to try to help people out further that may be in that situation. But our, our staff in the welfare department will refer people to um, specialized housing if they might be eligible for that. Um, so we, we try to direct them or we direct them to shelter programs if it's a more immediate need. And if that's not available, we may assist them temporarily in a motel or a rooming house situation. So I hope that answered your question. Could I follow yep. up? So, so do you, do you think, um, do you, is there enough shelter available in the city or do we need more? I think that's a good question and it could be answered two ways. There could be a need for more shelter if there's not enough affordable, accessible housing. If there was um, more affordable, accessible housing, there may not be need for additional shelter because the people would move through those shelter programs quicker and could get into the affordable housing or the, the more supportive housing situations, transitional housing, and they wouldn't need to stay in the shelters as long. So when we developed our plan to end homelessness some 15 years ago, one of the things we talked about was not creating more shelter. Um, that was 15 years ago. Um, the talk back then was to try to look at more affordable and accessible permanent supportive housing. We've done a lot of that over the course of that, that period of time. Um, but it seems like we haven't quite met that need yet. And there are still shelters operating at capacity on any given day. Um, so again, you could say if we had more shelters, we could probably easily fill those spaces up. Okay. And could I um, just a comment. Alderman Gathery, I just want to let you know there's some bleed through coming through your audio. So we can, what happened? We can hear some of what's going on in the background, and I'm not sure how much that's going to translate over to TV. So you might want to look at your phone and see if there's a, a button for muting your side. Just an idea. Okay. Um, All right. Thank you. Alderman Jetty and then um, Schmidt. Schmidt. All right. Uh, so the other question I had is, uh, I know that the state law uh, requires the city to help people who need help. And um, and I know that Nashua, I mean, we, we've talked about the, uh, the, the wonderful organizations that we have in Nashua that, um, you know, that are supported by donations, uh, in-kind contributions, and, and other means of support by the, by the citizens. Mm -hmm. Um, but the real, I think the, the state law makes it clear that the real obligation to, to care for people who need help is, is with the city. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, we're thankful for everything that the nonprofits do to help carry that burden. But, um, as far as your budget, and it's not, I know this, this committee can't do anything about that, but. Is is your budget adequate to to uh, provide uh, to fill fulfill the obligations that you have as welfare director? That's a great question. I think um, you know at this point we're about halfway through the fiscal year, and we're about halfway through our budget. So um, that being said, we, we pay close attention to that on a month to month basis. Uh, we do send a report. I send a report to the, the Board of Aldermen uh, on a monthly basis and the mayor. Um, we're keeping tabs on that. Um, we do have an obligation to meet certain needs and to pay for certain services. Um, part of that obligation is um, it's an assurance piece to kind of assure that there is a resource that can meet that need. 
For example, I, I refer to that, that shelter resource. Um, if someone is evicted and they are homeless, we may be required to help pay for some temporary shelter until some other resource is available or they have their own resource available to pay for that alternative shelter or, or that other resource can meet that basic need. So while we do have an obligation, our, it is, it's a pretty basic obligation. We do our best to fulfill that obligation. And um, so far over the last few years, we have been able to maintain within the, the budget that's been allotted through the mayor and the, and the board of aldermen to, to meet those needs uh, financially. There are um, communities that sometimes say, well, we can't help you because we don't have the funding for that. And, and we don't say that. We can't say that. We don't have the money to do it. But if there's an, another resource that will meet that need, we may refer to that, that resource. Um, but we, we, when I first started here 17, almost 18 years ago, the, um, the city had spent, I think it was close to a million dollars on uh, general assistance. And I started in January, so it was about halfway through the fiscal year. The budget was set at $650,000. So that's how I started my career as the welfare officer for the city of Nashua with a, a $350,000 deficit and halfway through the year. So that was an interesting time. And we worked very hard to build relationships with community partner agencies, as well as we had to build up some staffing so that we could provide more um, assessment of cases and more case management type services and referrals to some of these alternatives. Um, and, and kind of direct people to resources that could benefit them to move on from their situation, whether it be employment services, mental health services, other types of services, um, other mainstream services, get them connected to the state welfare department, for example. So uh, over the course of that period of time, we were able to, to reduce the general assistance budget. There were also other economic factors that impact that as well, you know, housing markets and rental markets and things like that. But um, again, another kind of long-winded answer to your question, we've been able to get to where we're at over the last few years, and we've been pretty stable with our general assistance budget. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Schmidt. Thank you. And then Catherine. Um, uh, the economy, of course, has a lot to do with it as well, right? Yes employment rates and such, but uh, can you give us an idea of, of the scope of this? How, how many people do you see who, um, say, just need a help through a month or two, and how many slip past that and wind up homeless? That's a, that's a good question. Um, uh, probably about 85 to 90 percent of the people that come in to see us are some sort of homeless prevention case. Um, they may be in need of uh, rental assistance or they may be in need of some utility assistance so that they can pay their rent. So right. we're so we're evaluating those kinds of situations. Um, I don't have any exact numbers off the top of my head. I have some percentages. We assist about 60 to 65 percent of the people that apply. And I believe we talked about this at a previous meeting. Um, some, that, that percentage could be kind of deceiving because some of those people we don't assist, we don't assist because we're able to connect them to some other resource. Mm -hmm. For example, um, uh, Alderman Garthright mentioned the, the fuel assistance program that um, she referenced and, and had taken advantage of at some point or, or had known people who had taken advantage of that. That's a program we refer a lot of people to through Southern New Hampshire Services. So if, if we're able to assess a situation and get them connected to that resource which is appropriate and can assist and meet that need, we don't assist, so it's considered a denial, but they've, they've had their need met. So, um, so those denials, it's, it may be a little... Uh, for a different reason. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Follow up. Yeah. Um, you, you, so you're not you're not a stovepipe. You no. you take in, in inquiries. You do what you can for those you can. You send right. uh, others to a more appropriate places for you. Um, it, it would help if the main page <coughs> of the Nashua website, Nashua uh, City website, mm -hmm. actually said something like, "Did you call nine two one one?" 
Um, I, I just went in looking, golly, how do I find rent? Where, where's the word on eviction? Mm -hmm. Uh, and using the search thing, it was really hard. So if that was just someplace on that main page, it might be really helpful. Because if they start there, 211 will definitely say, why don't you start with uh, start with the welfare department? Now you're saying the main page of? The main page of NashuaNH.gov. So that's not okay. even the city welfare's page. That's the main main page. Right. Right. So to get to the welfare department. I actually had to type the word page. welfare in yeah. the search. Yeah. Okay. And did it bring you to the welfare page? It did. Okay. But I tried a few other searches yeah. that I would normally, if I was just, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. rental, rent assistance, um, mm -hmm. Help. Uh, <laughs> none of that showed up. So, Well, that might be something that we could speak to the IT department about. It may just be a matter of how the Better search searches tools. come. Yes. I, I don't really know how all that stuff works, <laughs> um, but it's definitely something we can look into. Um, um, and if someone, just one more, I promise. Um, so 211 says get a hold of uh, Mr. Mack and he'll be able to help you. Um, well, I hope the, it says the welfare department and not just <laughs> Mr. Mack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so the process would be uh, call and make an appointment, uh, bring your lease, um, fill out a form or several forms. This is, I'm, I'm pipelining, of course. Um, then you have an interview with a case manager. Then should you be uh, lucky enough, you get a voucher that's specific just for rent. And then you need documentation to continue uh, with that person should you need any. Do you have any follow-ups for case managers on these? Follow-ups as far as referrals for the well, if, if someone has received their voucher yeah. and uh, you think everything is working, mm -hmm. um, at that point, do you want them to come back and talk with you again to make sure they don't fall into this trap again? Okay. Um, that's a good question. Generally, um, we are case technicians, so we're not technically case managers, but we do have those types of conversations with clients that come in. Um, we may not have them come back for an appointment, but... Sometimes if, if we're assisting somebody on an ongoing basis for a, a few weeks or a couple of months, they do come back and they're given a list of written re requirements and, and things they need to apply to and follow through on. And so we will tell them, go to these agencies and apply for these programs. Good. And then when you come back in the next week or two, and we'll set a specific date for their return, we want you to show us that you've done these things. Excellent. Show us evidence that you've gone to these things. So there, so there is some of that case management type of service that we provide. But some of these cases, um, we may see them, we may help prevent an eviction, and then we send them on their way. We will reference some of the, the resources that Alderman Lopez and, and others have, have mentioned this evening. We will also provide them oftentimes with that toolkit which they can click on the website and, and look at online or, or print off a copy. We'll give that to them, and we, we may highlight some of the, the agencies that we think could benefit them the most. Super. So, Thank yeah. you. Other woman, Cathright? Uh, actually, now that I think about this, but I'm going to share this with you. Several years ago, my dad passed in, um, let me see, 89, 99, 99. And he passed here in Nashua. But he had been ill and living in Pennsylvania. And I'd gone down to visit him that he was basically bedridden. And I had a brother that was taking care of him that was um, challenged himself because he was an alcoholic. And I could not leave my dad there. And I said to him, he said, well, I don't want to go to a nursing home. I said, you would never have to go to a nursing home, Dad but you would have to go back to New Hampshire with me. Now, this is a man that worked for a company for 47 years. He was 80 years old, you know, and of course he didn't want to leave his home that had been in all his life, you know, married life and what have you. But I convinced him that I loved him enough to bring him here, to, even though I worked, to take care of him as much as I could for whatever life he had left. But... And I say this because I think there are a lot of people out there that have loved ones that 
they take that challenge because they don't want their parents to go to home or wherever they need to go. And like I did, I just thought I could just bring them here, his Social Security, his uh, Medicaid, Medicare, all this stuff would just follow him like it did when he lived in Pennsylvania. That is not the case because I end up having to go to DHHS to file for all that stuff. I whether it was a transfer, what they did back then, I really don't even know. I just know that it was a lot of mental stuff for me. And I was, <laughs> as a variety of management person, I'm like, really, 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 you know. But um, got through all that case. And then I went to get his prescriptions. And they said his prescription was 500 and some odd dollars. And I thought I was going to faint. Now, I know he couldn't live without these prescriptions, right? So in Pennsylvania, he paid $3 per prescription. But that's a Pennsylvania thing. Didn't know that in New Hampshire, it's a whole different thing. However, and not to bomb out DHHS, but they did screw up back then. They never told me, this is another piece you need to do. <clears throat> so when I go to the pharmacy to get the man's prescription, I'm like, well, we don't have 500 something dollars And they said, go to city welfare. Bob, this was before you. There was another person at that time. You, you know who it was. was but anyway. Bob, I think. <laughs> another yeah, Bob. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't you. It was, but not you. And sure enough, and I worked in Lowell, Massachusetts, so first of all, you can't just leave work any time of day to come up to New Hampshire to, to go to city welfare to, for these appointments. So finally, I got frustrated, and I said to him, I said, look, I cannot leave Lowell to come whenever you say come to New Hampshire to take care of this, and this is my dad's life. You know, I have a job. So, you know, we worked all that out. We were able to work that out. But it wasn't until at that point when I went back to DHHS and I'm like, look, this is, I know you're waiting for the Medicare. You told me not to worry about it. They said they backtrack and they take care of everything. I said, but now we're talking about his medicine. And they said, go to city welfare. So I did go there. And that's how I got the help for my dad for that one month. Because by the time the next month came, that was the appreciative part. Because by the time the next month came, he was covered in New Hampshire. Unfortunately, six months later, he was deceased. But, you know, he bought you six I months. did get the help. But my point of the matter is, is the conversations that people, when you, I always felt that New Hampshire did not always tell you everything you need to do, even if they knew what you needed to do. So I feel as though the first day I went to DHHS, and they knew the situation with my dad, with me, how he got here, why he got here, da 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 da. They should have said, well, you know, his medicine that covered in Pennsylvania does not work here, and you have to do something a little bit different. You know what I mean? I just feel as though sometimes we don't always get and and the information that we need, and and more importantly is that the people behind those desk, do know what's needed. So the important piece is that we get what we need from the city, from the state, in all situations. Because without a doubt in my mind, like Bob says, people come to me and we, we know how to refer them X, Y, Z. Okay. That should happen across this state, in every city, every town, every county, so that's one of my battles is that we know the information. We need to make sure that people get that information. I get more calls from people, and I, and I think you guys know because usually I'm dealing with criminal justice stuff most of the time. I get more calls, and I'm dealing with those situations, but there's situations that they were not given the information they needed. And I find the same thing in the health field, in the substandard housing field, it's across the board that the information, if I know anything, let me give you everything I know that might be able to help you. And I think that if we all take that attitude, let me give you every situation that we think could possibly help you. 
If we take that attitude, I think people will be a lot happier in Nashua, no matter who they are. That's my end. Um, so just moving forward, just so you're able to finish your conversation without having to announce you're finishing it, just hit the button when you're done speaking, too. That way we kind of know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I just thought of that. Sorry for wasting the whole meeting. Um, but the um, the point made is a very valid one, but it's also one of the biggest challenges in social work is I have all kinds of information and knowledge after, like, 15 plus years of, of being a case manager, social worker, employment advocate, and all that. But I don't... I don't know what a person needs to know. And I've found that the more scenarios and information I tried to provide, the more they're concluding before I get to the one that applies to them that I don't understand what they need. They, they would imagine that, that I'm just throwing stuff at them because I want to get rid of them. And that's why that conversation has to be happening. And that's why there has to be access to case managers um, that can navigate it. Now, if that's not necessarily a role that our, our um, city welfare is designed at the moment to account for, we could have a conversation about whether we need case managers versus case technicians, whether that's rolling the clock back to something that was already done and not done as well as it could have been. I think the answer probably is more likely, um, Bob, I'll, I'll feel free to comment, the answer is more likely that city welfare is aware of programs that do it better, so they just refer to them. Um, but with regards to getting into a person's individualized situation, it's it's very difficult. Uh, Bob? Yes, I, I would agree. There are some, some agencies out there that we frequently refer clients to, to to receive case management services if they need longer term assistance or more assistance than just sitting in an office and discussing things um, that, oh, at a desk. Um, and that is why, but again, as, as you had mentioned uh, or asked about earlier, Alderman Schmidt, the uh, documenting and giving them information on resources and then having them come back to follow up to say, have you done these things? Um, that's a, a valuable piece as well, just to kind of make sure they follow through. Uh, Other woman, Gathright? Well, I just want to say is that actually, if you, if you want to look at the plug, it wasn't against city welfare because they did do what I requested. What I was, my statement was that the whoever I dealt with at that particular time at DHHS did not tell me that I needed to do that. So I had to go back to DHHS thinking they're going to help me. They said, oh no, you got to go to city welfare for that. But my what I'm saying is that if, 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 I, if someone gives an organization their life, their history, I do feel as though that organization should be able to direct the person in the right direction. I'm sorry. Literally. Okay. I've been around a long time and worked in a lot of different fields, both, uh, <laughs> you name it, but a lot of different fields. Okay. So I'm, I'm just saying that I know that sometimes we get people that don't have as much knowledge about their job, but what I'm saying is that people need to take, and I'm saying this because I really mean this, across the state, we need to take a more focused look at the jobs that we have, and particularly when we're dealing with the citizens of New Hampshire, Nashua, Manchester, Milford, anywhere. That's all I'm saying. So, and I know this is Nashua, but, you know, my passion is across the state. It ain't just Nashua. So I'm just saying that, you know, the people that are in those positions really need to be able to focus on the service that they give to whomever. And, Bob, that's not against you because I think you do a super job. I, li I literally think you do a super job. Thank you. I'm just saying that. We have pieces that we need as a, as a city to really come together and to really focus on really, I, I, I just think the nonprofits, I think the city does very well for the most part. And the nonprofits do very well for the most part. And the, the connection between all, I'm just saying that we just never, we, we should never, 
stop reaching out for perfection. That's what I need to know. That's what I need to say. I'm sorry. We're doing a great job. We're a great city. Love my city. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I'm just saying that we just need to continue to do a great job and always striving more to be a better city in all that we do for all the people in, in Nashua, not just those that, um, uh, not just those that have what they want or need, but those that don't. That's all. Um, well, I, speaking for myself, I definitely agree. Um, I think the, um, the, this kind of speaks to the issue that I mentioned earlier that the disproportionate impact of people that don't get their needs met easily or, you know, in, in crisis is felt in a city of 90,000 people. If we have, say, 30 that are unsheltered tonight, that's a catastrophe by any measure. But statistically, we are definitely, you know, doing very well. Um, it can be a challenge for somebody who um, sees the success of everybody else and says, oh, it's the number one best place to live in, in the country or whatever, but for them, they're not getting the assistance that they need. They're going to make more noise about it. They're going to be frustrated, and in that situation is going to be more represented um, in, in context. Uh, Alderman Gathright? The only thing, other thing that I have is that um, I know that we've been looking at places for people to go during the day so that they're not in, out in the cold weather, you know, because I think uh, those that are in shelters, if I remember correctly, they have to leave the shelter at a certain, certain time of day or something like that. Do you remember something like that? Yeah, all of the shelters have it's, operational hours. Okay. So if, if, if that's the case, and I know that we're struggling again with um, where, where people can go so that they're not outside in the elements. So um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, and I know that there are some issues. There are churches. I'm literally talking to my church um, about trying to help with that situation, and I know there are concerns. I'm not even sure how it's going to pan out, not just with my church, but other churches in the city, you know, because right down the street, you know, there's a shelter right down the street from my church. So we're trying to still trying to work out something Let's see if there's something that we can do to help. And I think that the major thing is probably a health issue. So, you know, whatever we can do or whatever suggestions the health department has or whatever suggestion anybody has, I think most of the churches are willing to listen. So I'm just throwing that out there. Oh, Thank sorry. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, so as chair, I want to kind of bring us back towards the discussion of uh, evictions. I will just add with a comment that a lot of the areas that we've been talking about that are outside the specific topic of housing and evictions are covered by the continuum of care, so I would encourage any alderman who can to participate in that and involve themselves, especially if they're leading any community efforts. That's where that community interaction that Bob has been talking about that is such a strength to our um, to our city welfare supports and, you know, from a budget perspective, allows us to force magnify through nonprofits. A lot of that conversation ha takes place at the continuum of care. So I definitely encourage people to look into that, find out more about it, and try to connect with them. And the more you interact with the general community of, of help, the nonprofits, the more we'll be able to make those tools like two-on-one effective as well because case managers will know who to refer people to, they'll be able to share information, and generally we can make a bigger difference if we're collaborating. Um, so I just want to ask that if anybody has any more specific questions about evictions. I do, actually. Uh, Alderman Schmidt. Um, so someone has contacted code enforcement and said that there's mold in my bathroom and I'm very sick. Um, and the landlord says you have to leave. You're you're evicted. What what's the next step? Do you know? Um, well, that that kind of moves into um, yep. <laughs> and we're in the next topic. <laughs> some of the, the response of of code and what the responsibility is of a landlord. Um, you know, there may be some environmental health involvement and some advice around how to 
remediate that sort of situation. But that, Is there an opportunity for you to help them find someplace temporarily while... Um, that is something that's usually discussed between the, the landlord, the tenant, possibly code. It may, it, if it's a situation where they have to leave, th there could be any number of factors there. We do sometimes get those those phone calls, and we try to we try to explore alternatives, and it, it can get complicated. Yes, complicated. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I was hoping we had a comment to that effect, but there are obligations typically spelled out in the lease where if a landlord isn't able to address an issue that, you know, violates occupancy, then the landlord does have the responsibility to provide an alternate housing situation. Um, I think looking at leases and ensuring that that's there is mm -hmm. important for anybody who has the ability to debate uh, their future housing situations. Um, I know that um, most of the programs that provide rent assistance uh, and things of that nature go over that too because they're not going to provide like a, a section 8 voucher or a bridge grant to a landlord who's not going to make sure that they're maintaining their their um, facilities so we did get a communication um, from the building department um, Nelson I had asked uh, multiple departments to summarize the number of calls that they generally responded to um, the scope of their activity like the top five or six uh, addresses that they, they were frequently uh, attending. And my idea behind that at the time was to look at things like um, who does code enforcement constantly have to talk to about maintaining occupancy standards? Who does the fire department constantly have to talk to about making sure fire safety is happening? And uh, the results were not what I expected, but the data is kind of along the lines of what you're referring to that there are specific expectations uh, of a landlord to maintain occupancy. Um, so according to the communication, and we, uh, I can ask the clerk to include these two in the, uh, the minutes of this meeting, um, you know, there's like a, an obligation to keep, uh, there's an obligation to keep uh, the ability to heat between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. Um, and then at 64 degrees, and then the ability to heat uh, for 68 degrees from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. So you basically you have to have equipment that with which you can you can heat your apartment, and it has to be functioning. This doesn't mean that the landlord has to pay for your heat bill. You do, um, but as long as the facility has that provided, that's an occupancy uh, standard. If there are health hazards like mold, that's another occupancy requirement that the landlord uh, needs to make sure is being addressed. Um, and then there was also references to, like I had asked about building integrity, such as um, like if there was a roof that caved in due to snow, that type of thing, because sometimes those happen. People are unable to occupy their apartment because of things that happen seasonally. Um, Alderman Gather, before we get to back to questions, we moved on to the second um, conversation. So I just wanted to ask uh, Bob really quickly, do you see uh, occupancy issues of that nature that are of a building or housing safety nature? We, we generally do not. We sometimes get questions about those sorts of things. We'll get phone calls and we will refer people to code enforcement to, to follow up with those things. But you don't see evictions due to um, inability to occupy the apartment? We, no, we don't usually see that that sort of situation. You mean someone where, where someone has has to leave? Due to someone has to vacate of, because something's not working, their heater's broken? Uh, or... Occasionally we do get some inquiries on that, I, I will say. We've had, uh, um, actually some people have been referred to us through code enforcement if they go in and they had to um, uh -huh. shut down a, a unit uh, because there's no heat or if it's, in some cases, it might be a, an illegal Yep. Apartment unit. <laughs> I was going like to say, I worked without, with a couple of those last year. <laughs> egress, um, and they will instruct the tenants that they can come down to see us um, if they're struggling with with finding alternative housing. And we have assisted some people in those situations. So, um, so the list of or the communication that we received has different scenarios that the building uh, department does encounter, um, and in the list of. Uh, locations with the number of complaints, the maximum number is like seven. 
and they're the six the top six uh, properties that have been visited repeatedly uh, are on that list. Um, just for the the committee's uh, knowledge, Alder Woman Gathright, I know you don't have a copy of this. Uh, I apologize. We had it printed and put on everybody's uh, desk, but there will be a copy in the minutes, so we can we don't necessarily have to go into super detail. And then uh, just before I open it up for a conversation, I also wanted to point out that if there's a like a, an emergency event, such as a fire that takes place, uh, the Red Cross is another resource that typically intervenes to provide a different system of emergency shelter and then housing supports. So one of the most important things that we've, we've heard from the fire department in the past is if your house starts to burn down, wait for the Red Cross to show up as well, I mean, not before calling the fire department. The fire department will intervene and do their thing, but don't just go leave and, and you know in a panic because the Red Cross has difficulty connecting with people, and sometimes because of all the disarray that happens and the trauma, and they have resources that can be very very helpful. So make sure you do make that contact if something does happen to your um, your place. Um, Alderman Gathright. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I don't know if this fits into this, so it might be just informational, and maybe one of you guys can help me in the right direction. But I had a constituent that called me, and um, their concern was one of the houses on their block that have been empty for a very long, for a long time. Obviously, the person pays their taxes and everything else, but the property is not kept up, and nobody lives there. Their concern was that the property was not kept up and that it affected the housing around it. Uh, from a property value perspective, I don't really have any suggestions, but from a building safety, if anybody sees from the outside any kind of violation like a hanging shutter or a broken window or something like that, right. then building enforcement can contact the, the building owner and then start that enforcement process. So I would just say okay. if your constituent was concerned, have the building code enforcement department take a look at it. Thank you. If they're just not mowing their lawn or something, they're not gonna, that's not going to be a violation. Right. That's just your neighborhood you. haunted house. Um, now, if you see occupancy, um, now I have another one. Uh, let me well. let me just finish really quickly. If somebody in the public sees a a seemingly unoccupied building that is being occupied, you can right. let uh, agencies know or the police know that somebody may be in there. We've had uh, a couple of fires over this year and and last that have been because yeah. those buildings don't have utilities. People are trying to find shelter and they're creating their own system. And sometimes that is not as safe as they would think. So it is helpful to let the police know if you see somebody that you believe may not be occupying a building with utilities because we they're not just going to go arrest a person for trespassing. They're going to get to know what the situation is. And a lot of times they'll refer people to places like the they'll have an outreach worker come from public health. I know Lewis is pretty good at that. Or um, they might have Sue Mead from Greater National Mental Health. And they can try to work out some options where a person can live somewhere safely. Um, what was your second question? That was it. That's, that, oh. that last comment actually address my second question. People it, um, occupying a building that definitely is not not up to par to someone living there. In the summer it's okay. people living outside, in the people in the winter it's people living inside, like people who don't have housing and don't have opportunity or don't have access to resources or maybe don't even fit the criteria of the programs and supports we have, we'll generally find a way to survive and the neighbors around don't really know what to do yeah. with that. Um, I'll also say that um, there's obviously a ongoing substance use epidemic. Um, it's been referred to as the heroin epidemic, the opioid crisis, the fentanyl crisis. Yeah. Um, I'm of the school of thought that we should just call it the SUD crisis because we're not going to keep up with what the latest, greatest mm -hmm. thing is. But um, because of that, there's a lot of people looking for support in recovery, and there's a lot of people who are not. They're pre-contemplative, and they haven't really reached the point where they're ready to challenge their addiction. And for that whole population, there are a lot of new programs. There's brand new um, transitional housing programs by Rise Above. 
there's new, there's ongoing, like ever changing and evolving programs to intervene, like the Safe Station program, Granite Pathways, um, and that is all an, a very dynamic uh, field. So it's very difficult for case managers to keep up with it. It's almost impossible for two on one to keep up with it. Um, yeah. All we can really do is keep bringing people to the table and saying, "What can you do to help? How are you helping?" And then when somebody comes asking for needs, figure out where the gaps are. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, Ellen McLean. It's okay. Um, yeah, the, this um, document that you have reporting no heat and running water. <coughs> I I do have a question on, and I I mentioned it earlier. Um, the for those that are that are elderly, <coughs> um, as well as those who are working in different, um, you know, odd odd shifts. My my concern is that perhaps this temperature is not good enough, especially if it's one. And I I look at um, those units in in my area that are very old homes that are being repurposed at, through doing um, apartments and so on. They may have rattier windows and so on. So 64 can be a very very cold for someone who's elderly and so on. And then I notice that the comment under there says that you can ask the manager to increase the heat and so on, but code enforcement can't force them to do it. Um, I just think on some of these these days is this could be a very very chilly situation and uh, you so never want the concern. apartment where the thermostat's next door. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because yours could be too hot or too cold. Um, I mean that's kind of what my concern is on this, and I, I'm glad that we at least set a standard, but I'm not sure that it's um, adequate for some of those things. And I, I also, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to make a comment about something that you said about the Red Cross. Um, I lived in Ogden, Utah, and my apartment burned down when I was home for Christmas. 30 some odd years ago. <laughs> yeah. And I got the call that I lost everything. I had everything completely lost. And I was lucky enough to have friends that stood there and said, because there was a gentleman below me who was smoking and my apartment went up. It, if I had been there, I wouldn't be here. Um, but the bottom line was it was the Red Cross that helped get me everything, that helped me get another apartment within that building, that helped me get clothes. I had nothing, nothing left except for what I had taken with me. So for those people, I want to reiterate if you're in an emergency situation for a fire or disaster of some sort, you're right. Stick there. And if you can't stick there because you have young children that you have to get someone, have someone there or get a hold of the Red Cross yourself. They, they will help with a little bit of a stipend, give you clothing allowances and, and so on. So it's, they're incredible. And, and the in the case of a disaster. neighbors be very helpful in helping yep. responders locate the person who's... Yes. Uh, you know, not yes. home because you never want to see your house burning down on like Facebook or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times people will go into survival mode and start figuring out what they can do and not make contact with some resources that are available to help. Yes. Um, is there any other questions or comments? Thought I saw some movement over there. Okay. Um, so I guess that kind of concludes the com the co second level of conversation. Um, so I want to put this thought in the minds of the committee members for the upcoming year is most of the issues that we've discussed have regional impact. Um, even the uh, the transition of benefits and all that kind of stuff. Um, is the scope of this committee doomed because of that? Or are there actually areas that we can make uh, tangible gains in? Um, some of the ideas we've talked about in the past uh, were expanding on the... Um, the landlord and tenant agreement, which is by city ordinance required to be given out to all um, landlords or to all tenants at the signing of the lease, that could include a reference to 211 or um, something to that effect. Um, we've talked about regu regulating um, reporting, like if there's, you know, an incident of bed bugs, you know, or a complaint that should at least be told to city welfare. What we found is there isn't really a way to easily keep track of that, but those are kind of steps that we could do within the scope of this, the committee right now to try to provide landlords uh, resources that are consistently and systematically handed out to everybody um, or to gather data on incidents and issues of concern so that we can un understand the true scope of those problems. Um, if we do make any amendments to the committee's charter, it's probably going to have to happen at the full board level. And I I had started to kind of feel around with some of the committee members about how they felt about doing that. But 
Um, I also realize that like this is the very end of the legislative year, so I don't know who's going to be on the committee next year. So it doesn't make sense to change the role of the committee without letting the future committee decide how that's going to work. Um, so I guess it would just be something to contemplate. Um, and in the meantime, definitely, um, I would encourage all committee members to look at the Greater National Continuum of Care, try to attend meetings if you can, look at their minutes, look at their resources. That's the hub of activity for nonprofits. It's basically their version of a chamber of commerce, um, except in their case, it's like a chamber of grant app application. Um, and try to join the effort without creating your own, just because if you do something in a vacuum, not enough people will know about it. You won't have access to the same kind of resources that might be available. And you might find a partner who has part of the solution already that you didn't or wouldn't have otherwise encountered. Um, are there any other final comments? Uh, Alderman Schmidt? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I really believe that um, this committee needs to be expanded. I think that housing is a much bigger issue than just st substandard, and I think we should talk about it next year. Uh, amending our, our our goal in this committee. And thank you for bringing it up. Um, I thought perhaps if it wasn't going to be uh, expanded, it should be disbanded because I think that there's very little more that we can do in just simply substandard. So thank you for the idea. And yes, if, uh, if we're lucky enough to be back together in this committee, I would say we should try to write something new for us. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Gathright? You still have your mute on. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I do agree 100% with um, Alderman Jane um, that either we're going to keep it, expand it, or we're going to let it go. Um, I think it would be a good thing to expand it, though. Um, I do remember when it first started, and I remember the horrible bed bug issues in Nashua, during that time period, I was very much involved with several tenants with that issue. Um, so, and I know that that's not the main issue right now, but there are issues as far as substandard living. So, um, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be a part of the team next year. But if I am a part of the team next year, I would be looking to expand it or either let it go. I would also observe, we could all learn from Alderman Cleese's example. She comes pretty regularly, even though she's not on the committee. So we can, any committee as Alderman, we have access to and can attend. Um, and this is an issue that hits a lot of our wards particularly hard. Um, yeah. So it's, it's good in terms of being able to share knowledge. Uh, I think the committee's been pretty successful about tackling issues like, you know, dirty water and um, code enforcement and, and that type of thing. Um, and making sure we have a way to disseminate that information helpfully. Um, tonight's uh, meeting is going to be uh, something that you can point to constituents to for a discussion of eviction processes and resources. So I think that role is definitely uh, one that could be maintained. It could be done through human affairs or something like that. Um, but I think what I'm hearing is looking um, at house housing stability as a, um, a committee focus rather than the quality of the housing, because we want quality housing to be the standard, not the focus. We want that to be the, the, the baseline. But mostly what we've been hearing is that people who are enduring substandard living conditions are doing so because they don't have housing uh, stability and they don't have housing choice. So I don't know what that committee should be named. <laughs> Chairman Lopez. Oh, uh, Alderman Klee. Uh, thank you. And, and, and I... Um, I, I know there are probably some wards that are that are hit harder when it comes to substandard um, living because of their older homes or, or closer knit um, um, residents and so on. I do think it's something that hits all over the city. I would hate to see this be disbanded, even if um, you met on a on less and you still looked at uh, substandard bed bugs is a big issue here. Um, one of the things I can tell you from constituents that I've that have called me, that yes, we've called code enforcement. We've gotten code enforcement to go in and to look into to places. But sometimes these residents are afraid to come forward themselves. They're afraid that they're going to be thrown out on the street, or they're going to be 
accused of the one who brought in the bed bugs or they're going to be accused of the one who are, are maybe hoarding something or keeping things too close because they had to downsize. So I, I think this committee is really necessary. I'm not sure that the public knows. I keep talking education. And the one thing I do, like when I do my newsletter, and I know um, Alderman Schmidt does one too, is we try to educate the constituents and educate the public of we have this substandard. Come talk. You know, bring it forward. If you won't bring it forward, have someone else bring it forward. People don't understand that they can contact code enforcement. And and code enforcement has limits of what they can do. They can't just barge in, barge in because you said you have bed bugs and, and demand that testing be done. But they can help you through the process and so on. So I think this committee is an extraordinarily education founding kind of committee that you can help people. I would hate to see it go, and I would hate to see it be absorbed with human affairs. I'm on human affairs, and, and I think it would get bogged down. This is where it needs to go, and I think you do need to expand. So good luck next year, and whether I'm on it or the rest of your committee are on it, I will still be here. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Alderman Gathright? Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because I, I, I press the button for mute, then I go back to another button. I'm like, okay, am I still on or not? But anyway, um, I do, I truly do believe that if, if, if we can expand it, it would be great. I really do feel that way. However, if we're going to stick to, and not that the bed bug issue has gone away, <laughs> but we're very much aware as a city. We're very much aware as code enforcement. Okay, so so in, in, it's kind of like, you know, I have your attention, this is where we are, and this is what we're doing to work out that issue, okay? However, in terms of new issues that we could address, um, like I like the issue about the, the fact that people don't always know who to turn to for different things, um, however, from what? That presentation that Bob did basically stated that if they come to us, they get something that allowed them to go back to some other organization to get the assistance that they need if we can't help them. I think that is great. The fact that we do do that, even under these circumstances, even though some of us think that um, welfare, city welfare, should take care of that issue, it's not always that way. But the great thing is that the city welfare is able to guide the person to where they need to be to get the assistance that they need, even though we personally, as a city, did not do it. So I, I don't know. All those things, I like those things that are happening. I really understand those things that are happening. But I truly be, believe that a lot of our stuff has to be with more information getting out to the city and to our constituents. So I think what I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, okay. <laughs> so I think what I'm hearing is, is that we should be focusing as a committee on the nature of the landlord and tenant relationship um, and mm -hmm. legislative city efforts that may impact that. Um, when we were having the discussions about the bed bugs, the discussion, we had an, a, a pretty thorough uh, presentation by public health about bed bugs and what their life cycle was and how to exterminate them and all that. But the focus really was on like, how does a landlord respond to those? And what is the tenant's rights in addressing those as well? Public health can handle bed bugs as a, um, as a health issue that the health commission meets regularly. And if there was some kind of sudden recognition of something that bed bugs, you know, were causing harm to or, or becoming a problem for, I'm sure they would tackle that. But where this committee's focus was was on how landlords and tenants are interacting around that problem and how they're negotiating to a solution in a way that maintains housing stability. Um, Alderman Gathright? Still on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Just practicing. <laughs> So uh, the say about that as well is that um, if if there's an issue that we can address, let's say from a state level at this point, in terms of um, what's expected, then I think we would look at that, and I think that's what we might be trying to address at a at a state level as to how we might deal with 
Um, Because I do know that the landlords come up and they testify quite often about their properties and what they feel they're, what's expected of them. Um, Now, I don't go to those meetings, but if there's something that we think for the tenant that needs to be represented as well, might be something we look at. And that goes as far as even in terms of um, the um, the eviction process in terms of whatever it might be. So I'm just throwing that out there. Okay. I appreciate your comments. I think this is something that we first and foremost need to talk to the um, the president of the Board of Aldermen once she's elected to the following term um, and then um, and see where her thoughts are. And then if we were going to expand or adjust it, then that's probably something that should be the work of the committee once it convenes so that the the players are all engaged and involved. Um, Any other questions or comments? All right. About anything? Um, Well, let's close this discussion item and then we'll just open it up for general discussion. So, yes. Okay. So, I uh, would like to move that we accept the... uh, Memo from uh, Nelson Ortega of the Code Enforcement Department, mm-hmm. dated, dated December 9th, 2019, and, and uh, with the accompanying uh, page, uh, two pages entitled Reporting No Heat of Running Water, and place it on file. Okay, you have heard the motion. Um, all in favor say, oh, uh, Alderman Gathright. You have discussion? Okay. So where was that for? Was there a location? Or I don't know. Maybe you can't tell me. I don't know. I don't oh, have yes. that paper. So I can, I can describe it for you. Um, but basically, okay. we received the communication that um, Alderman Jetty uh, provided. Um, it has seven locations and a, a brief summary of uh, what each one represents. Like there's 90 to 92 Toll Street, which has seven complaints, 43 Chestnut Street, which has six. I'm sure all of these addresses love having me read it out loud. Um, and then um, there's uh, a quick summary uh, by the building department of different uh, code enforcement issues that might be an issue for occupancy. So when we're talking about yeah. something that where a, a unit could be deemed unable to be occupied, this goes over mm-hmm. what those are. So Alderman Jetty is just motioning that we include that communication in the um, in the minutes. Okay, I I agree. But let, let me just ask you something. So those other locations, where are they? Uh, I'm just curious because it Mr. sounds Chair? like one of the locations that I was speaking of. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Shall we just let her know that we'll uh, make sure that she can receive a copy of it? We'll put it in well, her. Desk. Yeah. Would that be okay? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is fully in the minutes. I just feel like we don't need to read people's addresses out. Okay. <laughs> it's a little awkward. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So if there's no further discussion, uh, all in favor, say aye. We actually, aye. because there's someone on uh, the phone. We, we have to do roll, roll call. call. You're right. Roll Thanks call, for reminding please. me. Um, okay. So we're going to do this by roll call. Uh, the clerk yeah. will just read each member who's present, um, who is also a committee member, um, if you'd like to call the roll. Uh, Alderman Lopez. Yay. Uh, Alderman Jetty says yes. Alderman Schmidt? Yes. Alderman Linda Gathright? Yes. That's it. Okay, so we've accepted that communication. So there are one, two, three, four, four yeas and no nays. Um, all right, so with that piece done, um, I don't see anybody here for public comment, so we could have some remarks by Alderman if there are any. Well, okay. Gotta press the button. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just gotta figure out. I gotta show you my phone because I literally have a cancellation of this, and I know I didn't do it. Hmm. So I don't know if it was done by mistake, but it's. I, I went back into my um, um, my calendar, and yes, this meeting was canceled in my phone in my calendar. Is that, is that connected to the city calendar? Yeah. So I'm, I, well, I think it's connected to the city because I respond 
because something came out to make sure we were going to be there, and I yeah. responded that I would be there. Yeah, we so should definitely look into that because we don't want to confuse people. It's yeah, still because after Trisha, after Trisha called me, um, I'm rep- uh, Alderman <laughs> Clee called me. Okay. After she called me, I'm looking at, I know I got this was canceled. And I went back, and sure enough, it still says canceled. It's, so I'm, I'm it's still curious, on the, the so. site that's accessible to the public, so that's a relief, but we should yeah. make sure the automatic calendar isn't like playing games like Harry Potter where we change movies or, or yeah. meetings around I'm or whatever. I'm like, wow. And I was nearby. I was nearby. I could have came. So, you know, but I was like, well, no, not at this point. But we but appreciate the extra effort you made to be involved. Oh, yeah. It's obviously I didn't tricky even think being, about you know, calling in. trying to have a meeting with Charlie's I Angel here. I didn't think about calling in because that was a hassle, but I'm glad you thought of it and you spoke to it, and I joined the call. So I'm happy that I joined the call. I did learn quite a bit. Okay. Um, and then um, are there any further comments, Alderman Gathright, while you still have the floor? Any announcements or remarks? Um, I'm always reminding folks that um, we will be celebrating breakfast, on January the 20th, Monday, January the 20th, at Alpine Grove. And if anybody has any questions, please contact me. Okay. I've been to that before. It's a really good time. <laughs> um, and, okay, so there's no other remarks. I will just announce uh, on December 23rd at 6 p.m. on the steps of City Hall, we're having our annual uh, homeless vigil. Uh, we typically have it on the winter solstice, which is the longest night of the year. This year, the winter solstice is falls on a Saturday, so we were worried about attendance. By having it on Monday, not only are we going to have, um, you know, it's a work day, so a lot of a lot of case managers like to attend, um, so they'll be able to. But it'll also be right before an alderman meeting. So um, if anybody would like to attend uh, and be willing to, um, it's definitely an opportunity to show your support for people who have experienced the longest night, who have spent the night unsheltered. Um, and it's also an opportunity to remember people who have passed away that have experienced that as well, who uh, typically can fall beneath the cracks or, you know, be remembered only by a, a few. Um, if anyone has names of people that they want to make sure are remembered, um, just email that to me uh, and, or message me. Um, my information is okay. on the website. All right, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. I like the motion to adjourn. <laughs> All right, then without objection, we are adjourned. Oh, okay, you're right, roll call. Um, <laughs> Sorry. All right, let's do a roll call uh, for adjournment, yes. Mr. City Clerk. Every vote. Alderman Lopez. Yay. Alderman Jetty votes yes. Alderman yeah. Schmidt. Yes. Alderman Linda Harriet Gathright. Yeah. Sorry. Then we are adjourned and don't apologize. <laughs> you just reminded us, so we close our meeting and don't have it just hanging for the rest of the year. I just ask a question. Sure. I think the last time around we didn't do Smith. We did Clee, didn't we? No. 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 It was it was only members. Okay. All right. Maybe it's me. All right. Have a good night, Alderman.